Hi, and welcome to this webcast on deploying a Blazor app to Azure with Octopus Deploy. Before we get started, a little bit about me. My name is Pete Gallagher, and I'm an IT consultant. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Azure MVP and a Microsoft Certified Trainer, and a Pluralsight author, so I like to keep myself busy. So today we're going to talk a little bit first about DevOps and what that is. So the Wikipedia definition of DevOps is that it's a set of practices that combine software development, which is the dev, and information technology operations, which is the ops. It aims to shorten the system's development lifecycle and provide continuous delivery with high software quality. And we may have seen this DevOps diagram around all various different flavors of this, where we have uh, on the left, we have the dev cycle where we can plan, create, verify, and package. And then on the right, we have the ops cycle where we have release, configure, and monitor. And then we join the circle back and we keep this loop going and we continuously improve our software. So where does Octopus Deploy fit into this? So Octopus Deploy is a single place for your team to manage releases, automate deployments, and automate the runbooks that keep our software operating. If we go back to the diagram we saw earlier, where we have the development lifecycle on the left-hand side and the operations lifecycle on the right, well, Octopus Deploy concentrate mainly in this release space here. And obviously the name is a clue where the deployment is where Octopus are concentrating their efforts here. So unlike other pieces of software that try and cover that entire DevOps pipeline, Octopus are concentrating all of their energy just in that deploy part there. So what are some of the things that uh, Octopus give us? So it forms part of your existing CI CD pipeline and has over 450 integrations. So on both sides of this process where we have things like perhaps Jenkins or Azure DevOps, we can then hook Octopus Deploy into that pipeline there to concentrate on the deploy steps. And then from that deploy step, we can then send out notifications to Slack or, or deploy scripts onwards from that that affect the rest of our infrastructure. We also have this theory of runbooks which allow us to be able to perform additional operations on top of our normal deploy, where we can say perhaps patch a server or stop a website or fail over if there's been a disaster, or say deploy an Azure ARM template as part of this process as well. We can also, as part of a good version control policy, uh, configure a lot of this as code using HCL, which is the same language that Terraform uses, uh, which means that once you've got this configured as code, then we can check that into your version control system, and then we can keep a good track of how the, these processes are, are modified and improved over time. A couple of nice things is that we can either run it in the cloud or in your own infrastructure, either in a VM or, or on a local machine. There is then the concept of something called a, an octopus tentacle, which allows you to be able to perform these deploy steps cross-platform on, on any system that you like. So with that all said, um, let's leap straight into the demo. And so we start here on the Octopus Deploy dashboard, where we can create our first environment and create deployment targets and then so on. Over here on the right hand side, we have the help section, quick guide, overview and video tutorials. And if we click the resources tab here, then we've got a link to the documentation for Octopus Deploy. And if we have a quick look at that, um, it's an excellent resource for getting started and end-to-end -end tutorials, training videos. And then there's a set of links for all the other different parts of uh, Octopus Deploy documentation, which is fantastic. Okay, so let's go ahead and return to the dashboard and we can create ourselves an environment. All right, click the create your first environment. Environments are a way for us to be able to group together our development, staging, and production deployment targets into logical groups. Um, we'll go ahead and click the Add Environment button, and we'll create ourselves a development environment, and press Save. And we get a bit of information here about the environment itself, whether it's development, default guided failure mode, and dynamic infrastructure, and so on. But for now, we'll go ahead and create a staging environment, and press Save. And then we'll create another environment for production. And in fact, we can click these links below to automatically populate that name box. 
Okay, the next thing we need to do now is create the deployment target, which is where our code will be deployed. And this could be anywhere from a local Linux or Windows machine all the way through to Azure or Kubernetes. So if we click the Add Deployment Target button, we can then choose between various different deployment targets, including Windows, Linux, Mac, Azure, Kubernetes. Uh, we can even do an offline package drop if we don't have direct access to that particular location. We're going to use Azure here. And if we scroll down, we can see the various Azure deployment locations we can choose from, uh, from cloud services and VMs, Azure Web Apps, and Service Fabric clusters. Uh, we're going to use the Azure Web App here because we'll be deploying to an Azure App Service. So we can go ahead and click the Azure Web App. And so the first thing we need to do is give our deployment target a name. Now, we'll be creating a deployment target for each of our different environments, one for dev, one for staging, and one for testing. So we'll call this one Peak Codes Web App Dash Development. Okay, next we need to choose the environment uh, that this deployment is going to use. And if we select the environments, we can see we have development, staging, production. We'll choose development for this one. Next up, we need to set a target role. Now, we're not going to be diving into target roles here, so we'll just choose web. But below this, we can see that target roles are a way to be able to tag our deployments so that you can run them either in the web or perhaps on an app server or a database server, for instance. Right, and next up, we need to add an account for this deployment. We don't have any accounts at the moment, so we'll hit the plus add button. And an account can be anything from an Azure subscription through AWS credentials to a username and password, for instance. So if we click the Add Account button, we can see here we have Azure subscription, AWS account, and so on. We'll choose an Azure subscription, and we can give our Azure subscription a name. So we'll call it Azure Sponsorship, and we can give it a description as well. So we'll call this our Azure Sponsorship account. Next up, we're going to need a subscription ID, which we can see down here. Um, we can grab this subscription ID from the portal. So if we switch across to that, I've got my list of subscriptions here. I'll grab the subscription ID and paste that into this box. Uh, next, we can choose the authentication method. We'll leave this as service principal. And next, we need the tenant ID. Again, we can grab this from the portal. So if we switch back across to the portal, and if we search for Azure Active Directory in the search box, then if we go to the Azure Active Directory service, then we can see our tenant ID just here. So if I click that copy button and we've returned back to the Octopus Deploy setup, we can paste in our Active Directory tenant. Next, we need an application ID and we need to create uh, an application in our subscription and assign it to our subscription and give it the necessary policies. So if we switch back across to the portal again, we can create a brand new uh, application. So we can click the add button in our Active Directory to create a new application. And if we call our new application Octopus Deploy, and we'll leave the supported account type at accounts in this organization directory only, and we can enter the redirect URI, and we know that this is our local host, localhost colon 8090, and save that. The next thing we need to do is copy this application ID and paste that back in, so we can do that. Next, we're going to need a application password and key. And we can grab that from the portal. So if we switch over to the portal, we can create ourselves a new client secret. So if we go ahead and go to the Certificates and Secrets section, so if we click New Client Secret down at the bottom, then we can give this secret a name, so we'll call this Octopus, and we will leave the expires at the recommended six months and save. And we can copy this uh, secret value here, and then we can paste that back into our setup, just here, and paste that in. And we can scroll down and there's a couple more options. And we're going to use this Azure subscription across all of our environments. So we'll enter the development, staging and production environments in that box. And our Azure account is almost set up. But if we go up and press the save and test button now, we'll see that we'll get a failure. 
And it's complaining because we haven't yet given our app the necessary uh, permissions in our subscription. So if we switch back to the portal, then we go back to the subscription that we were using. So this is this top Azure sponsorship subscription. If we click on the access control IAM link at the top, we can then assign the necessary access for our new app. So we go to role assignments and we can add a new role assignment here. And we can select the role. Now we only need contributor for this, so we'll select contributor. And then in here we need to find our octopus. So we can't find it directly in the list, but if we just type octopus, then our octopus deploy app registration is there. And we can click the save button. And then that means that we can now press the save and test button and their account was verified successfully. So I can hit the OK button. OK, and with that, our Azure account is nicely set up. So if we return to our deployment target page and we refresh our list of accounts, we'll then be able to select our new Azure sponsorship account. Next up, we need some web apps. So if we drop down the list, we'll see the existing web apps in my account. We know that we're going to need three web apps, one for development, one for staging, and one for production. So we have a development deployment target. So let's switch over to the portal and create ourselves a development web app. Okay, so if we search for web app and choose app services, then we can create ourselves a new web app. If we choose our subscription and create a new resource group to hold our web app, so we'll choose Octopus and OK that. We'll uh, give our web app a name of Pete Codes Development. And then we'll leave the publisher's code. And for the runtime stack, I'm going to choose .NET 5. And we'll leave the operating system at Windows and choose North Europe for our deployment region. Next, uh, we'll choose the plan. So we've already got a plan, but I'll create a new octopus plan here. And for the SKU and size, we can actually use the free SKU here. So if we click the link and then we click the dev and test area. Then we can choose F1 and apply that. So that's not going to cost us anything. And if we click the next deployment button, we can leave continuous deployment disabled. And then next monitoring. And if we just turn off application insights, because we're not going to need that for this demo, and then through tags and review and create, and we're happy with this, not going to cost us anything. Uh, the free tier, so that's great. And then hit the create button. And our deployment will take a little while. Obviously, we know that we're going to need a uh, staging and production one of these in a bit, but we'll come back and create those shortly. And once this is finished creating, we'll be able to then switch back and choose it. So that looks like that's pretty much finished. And there we are, that's finished now. So we can go to the resource just to make sure that we're happy with that. And if we switch back then to our deployment target, and if we scroll down here, we can hit the refresh button against the web app. And now if we drop down the list, we should be able to select the Pete Codes Development Octopus North Europe web app. Uh, we're not going to use web app slots here, uh, but that would allow us to do um, development, staging, testing, things like that as well. Uh, if we just hit the save button, then that's our development target all sorted. So if we head back to our dashboard now, we can see that the next step is that we need to package and upload our software. So if we go to the library, we'll be able to see the page for our built-in package repository. The Octopus package repository is the uh, place where we can store all of our pre-built binaries or zipped up packages that we're going to deploy as part of our deployment process. Uh, this isn't like a full NuGet package manager or uh, something like that. This is just simply a place for us to be able to store our various released files. So to create a package, in our case, uh, if we click the Create Packages button, we're presented with some options about how we can do that. 
uh, we're going to be deploying an ASP.NET Core application essentially. So if we click that button, then we can see here that we have some uh, manual steps we can go through, including uh, using .NET Publish, and then we can use the Octo command line, octo.exe. But the first thing we need to do is create our Blazor application. So if we switch over to the command line, so if we go to our root directory, we can create a nice directory for our application. So we'll make a directory called Octopus Apps, and we'll go into that directory. And then if we create a new .NET Blazor Wasm application, and we tell it that it's going to be in the output directory of Pete Codes, let that create. Then we can go into our peak codes directory and we can spin this up just to have a look at it. And our application is running. So if we switch over to our browser, then here we have the vanilla Blazor application that you may or may not have seen if you've played with Blazor yet. So if we switch back to the command line now and we stop our application from running. The next thing we need to do is create a set of published binaries uh, that we can then package up and store in our Octopus environment ready for deployment out to our development, staging and production environments. So we can use the .NET publish command to bring that down. So we can do .NET publish dash dash output and then the name of our directory, so publish dash app, and then we'll set the configuration to release. So we can hit enter and the .NET command line will then package up all of our files into the published dash app directory ready for us to carry on and use so that we can create something for our Octopus deploy environment. So we can see that it's compressing the Blazor WebAssembly publish artifacts. This will take a moment and that's complete now. So the next thing we want to do is package up our published files into a NuGet package. Uh, we've got a couple of ways of doing this actually. We could use the Octo command line tool or we can actually install a .NET tool that allows us to be able to do this using the .NET command line. We can do that with the .NET tool install and then we make it global and we can install the octopus.net.cli tool extension. We need to specify a version here otherwise we'll also need to specify that we can use the preview version. And then once we've done that, we can then use the .NET Octo pack command, passing in an ID of peak codes and a version of 1.0.0, and also then the base path of publish-app, which is where our published files are. And if we hit the Enter key, then we'll begin packaging up our app. And that's complete. And if we have a look at the directory now, we see here in the middle we have our peak codes 1.0.0 NuGet package. So if we return now to the Octopus deploy page, we can close this dialog and hit the upload package button. And then if we click here in the middle, we can then navigate to our Octopus directory. There it is. And into peak codes and we can then upload our NuGet package. And I hit the upload button. And our package is uploaded and we're ready to use it. Another great feature of Octopus is its ability to be able to replace variables within files. So say our solution has an app settings.json with variables in it, we can set Octopus to replace those variables based upon, say, where we're deploying to. So if we switch over to the command prompt and we open our solution in VS Code, we can add an app settings.json file to our solution. If we expand the www root directory and right click, and we add a new file and we call it app settings.json. And in here we'll put just a simple variable to set uh, the h1 font size to 50 pixels for now. And if we close these pop ups down, if we go into the pages directory and to our index.razor, we can make use of that by bringing in a couple of using statements. And then we can add an extra h1 tag in here that will make use of our new h1 font size variable. And there we go. And if we save that, and we return to our command prompt and run this back up again.
and then switch over to the browser and refresh. Now we have our configuration example and we're using the 50 pixels that we set in our app settings.json. So let's just make sure that that works. So if we return to VS Code and back to our app settings.json, let's change the font size down to 10 pixels and save that. And if we return to our command prompt and then stop that code and then run it back up again. And then we return to the browser and refresh. And now we can see our configuration example title is reduced down to 10 pixels. So let's switch back over to Octopus and make use of this. If we add a project and we create a project called Peak Codes and press save. Projects in Octopus Deploy allow us to be able to collect together the deployment steps and releases, as well as configuring variables and then setting the environment to which we'd like our software to be deployed to. Now if we scroll down on the left, we'll have a variable section. Then here we can enter variables that we want to replace within our file. So if we enter a variable here that matches the same variable in our app settings.json, so if we switch back over to the app settings.json file and we copy our h1 font size variable and we enter that here. We can also change the type here to anything that we'd like, so an Azure account or an AWS account, but we're going to leave that as just a value type. So we set the value to 50 pixels. And here we can set the scope. Now there's various different settings we can choose from here, but we're just going to choose the environment setting and for development, we'll have this set to 50 pixels. And then we can go ahead and press the add to list button to add it to our variable list. So if we hit the save button, while we're here, we can repeat this same value for our different deployment environments. So we can add a value here now for 10 pixels and we can define the scope for that to be Staging. Instead of creating a new value, we can actually duplicate the value. So if we hit the menu button on the right, we can duplicate that value. And then we can simply change this then to our production environment. And we'll change this then to 100 pixels. And we'll go ahead and hit the save button. We can also preview the variables under various different conditions. So here we can change this to production and we can see our H1 changes to 100 pixels and if we change it to staging, it changes to 10 pixels. We also have the concept of library variable sets and these allow us to be able to share variables across various different projects. So if we return now to our project and into the Peak Codes project, before we can go any further, we need to create a new packaged version of our application. So if we switch back over to the terminal and stop the application, we can run another publish command to create the published binaries. And this is of course going to take into account the new app settings.json file along with the changes we've made to the index.razor file. And that's now going to complete. There we go. And now if we pack our application back up again, increasing the version here to 1.01, .01, and we can see now we have our peak codes 1.0.1 NuGet package. So if we go back to the library, we can upload this new version of our package. We can see here we have version 1.00 currently. You can see here a little bit of information about our packages, including the repository retention, and also the facility to be able to enable package indexing, which we'll do. And if we hit the Upload Package button, we can upload our new 1.0.1 .1 NuGet package. And if we go back to Packages, we can see now the highest version is our 1.0.1. .1. And if we click our little Steps icon in the bottom right hand corner, we can see our next step is to define the deployment process. So if we navigate back to our project, so the Picos project, we can begin the process of defining our deployment process. The deployment process is a set of steps which takes us from our compiled binaries out to deploying to our targets. We can define as many steps in there as we like to be able to accomplish this, and then we can continue after the deploy is complete to be able to send out notifications to our team, for instance. 
So let's go ahead and create our first deployment process. If we click the define your deployment process button, we can add our first step. Octopus comes preloaded with a fantastic set of built-in templates that we can use to create steps. So everything from a basic script through Azure and AWS and Terraform and onwards. We're going to be deploying our app to Azure, so we can click the Azure option here and scroll down. And we can see we have a set of Azure templates we can choose from. Everything from deploying an app service and running a script, deploying app fabric, and for us, we can deploy an Azure web app using web deploy. We click the add button, and then we can give our step a name, and we'll leave that at the default of deploy an Azure web app. Then we can enter some notes and say we'll have deploying a web app, Next, we can enable or disable the steps, and then we can choose the execution location, and we'll be running this on the Octopus server directly. And then we can choose the target roles, just like we had before, so we'll select web. We can run this step either directly as a worker or within a container like Docker. Next, we need to choose which package we're going to deploy, and we'll deploy from the Octopus server repository, and we'll choose our peak codes app. Next, we can optionally set a deployment slot. So if we're going to be deploying to different URLs, then we can deploy our app this way. We're not going to use that particular method. We can then specify the physical path where the app will be deployed, remove additional files, preserve app data, enable app offline, where you can set the file comparison method and enable legacy mode. We're going to leave all of those as they are, but what we will do is configure some extra features. If you remember from earlier, we set up the feature to be able to replace variables within files. The configure features function here allows us to be able to do that. If we were replacing .NET configuration variables, there is actually a step for that. However, we're replacing within an app settings.json files. So we'll choose structured configuration variables. Next, we can set the target files that we'd like to apply this to. Ours is going to be appsettings.json, and we need to make sure that we get that in any folder within our path, so we can prepend that with star star backslash. Scrolling down, we have a few other options, but that's pretty much all we need to set up for now, so we can hit the Save button. And with that saved, uh, we have our first step. Now, the next thing we want to do is add a manual intervention step. This is going to allow us to be able to gate the steps. So we can gate, for instance, our production step to make sure that nobody can deploy to production without a certain level of user proving the deployment first. And so we'll go ahead and add another step for this. If we hit the Add Step button and then scroll down, we can select the Built-in Steps option. Scrolling down, and we have various different steps we can choose from here, from deploy a package to running an Azure script, deploy an Azure web app, and this is essentially every step that we can choose from in the built-in set of Octopus steps. The step we'd like to choose is the manual intervention required step. If we click the Add button next to this, we can configure this step if we scroll across. We can leave the step name, notes, enabled, execution location, container image, all as they are, and we can enter some instructions here that'll appear when this step starts. We'll choose please approve this release. We can then set the responsible teams to one of the built-in options. We'll choose Octopus Managers and Octopus Administrators. We can leave the block deployments as it is to allow another deployment to begin. And we can change the environment to run only for our production environment. And we can leave the rest of these options as they are, and then hit the Save button. Returning to our steps up the top, we can see that these are now in the wrong order. But we can reorder these steps using the Reorder Steps function. So clicking the menu beside Filter, we can choose Reorder Steps, and then we can drag our Manual Intervention step above the Deploy step, and hit the Done button. And now we have Manual Intervention required and Deploy an Azure Web App. And then we can save our steps. So now we can create our first release. So if we head over to Projects, we can see we don't have any releases yet, and we can click the Create a Release link to begin our first release. 
This release will default to 0.0.1. We can find some more information about how we can go about naming our releases there. Next, we can choose which package we deploy. We're going to deploy the 1.0.1 package here, but we also have the option to be able to deploy 1.0.0, should we choose. We'll leave this at 1.0.1. .1. Next, we can create some release notes if we need, but we'll leave that blank and hit the Save button. And we return to the release page and we're prompted to deploy to development. If we scroll down, we can see that this is going to deploy version 1.01 .01 of our package. And we can see here as well that we have a snapshot of the variables when the release was created. And we can see the scope that we're using for each of the variables. Scrolling back to the top, at this point we can deploy to development. Go ahead and hit the button. We're then shown the details about this particular deploy and we can hit the deploy button to begin deploying. We can see on the left we have the steps that are currently being processed and then our deploy is complete. If we look here we can see that we've correctly replaced our app settings.json variables and with that deployed we can click the link below to be able to open up our website and have a look at the result. If we wait a second for this to warm up and load And there we have our configuration example shown at the top on our development web app. Now that we have that working, if we return to our project and to the variables, let's try changing that H1 font size to say 25 pixels. And if we save that and create a new release and save this and then deploy again to development and let this complete, And there we go, and if we return again to the website, and then refresh, we can see that our configuration example has reduced its font size. Okay, so now that we've got our development environment all set up and we can see that working, uh, we should add in our staging and production environments. So if we switch over to the portal, if we then go back to app services, and we can go through exactly the same steps as before. So if we create ourselves a new web app and we select the correct subscription and then the correct resource group, Octopus, then we can give our app a name of Pete Codes dash staging. And again, we'll leave publish as code and we'll select a runtime stack of .NET 5 again. And then the region of North Europe again, keep everything in the same region and then select the correct plan, our Octopus free plan. And then we can next through into deployment and leave that as it is, and then monitoring. And then we can turn off application insights and then press tags and then leave that. And then hit the create button. And then while that one's deploying, we can create another web app for production. So we create and then select the right resource group. And then we'll call this one just Pete Codes because this is our production website. And there our previous deployment succeeded, which is nice. So if we scroll down, we can select a runtime stack of .NET 5 again, and then leave that at Linux, choose a North Europe region, Choose our octopus plan and then go through again deployment, leave that as it is, monitoring. We'll turn off application insights and go ahead and click the review and create button and create to create our production website. Then we can just wait for this to complete. We've seen that the previous deployment completed successfully. Let's have a look at that. Just make sure that's running and that all looks okay to me on the octopus free plan again. If we click back into apps, then now we can see peak codes, peak codes development and staging. And so if we switch back over to the Octopus deploy pages, then we can now set up our infrastructure so that we can deploy to our new staging and production websites. Then if we see here, we've got development, staging and production with development having one deployment target and staging having none. If we click the staging option, 
we can add a deployment target and we'll click Azure again and we'll scroll down and click add for the web app and we'll give our display name Pete codes dash staging and then we'll select our staging environment and then web as the target role and then we'll select our Azure sponsorship as the account and then here we can drop down and find the Pete code staging Octopus North Europe option and then we'll again leave web app as it is and hit the save button and then we can add another now at this point to do our production so again Azure and Azure web app and then we can do Pete codes dash production and then for an environment we'll select production and then the target role we can select web again account yet again Azure sponsorship and then here we'll select our Pete codes Octopus North Europe option and again leave that and click save and there we have our infrastructure set up so we can see development staging and production all have one deployment target now so if we go back to projects and back to our peak codes and we can see that we've deployed to development and now we have staging as the next option so if we hit the deploy button in the staging column we're then presented with the same options of when to deploy excluded steps failure mode package download if we hit the green deploy button then we can begin deploying to our staging environment and we'll let that complete we can have a look at the logs by clicking into them and we can see again that it's replaced our app settings.json and that's completed and so if we click the link now to open the staging website that'll take a little sec to warm up And there we have our staging website with its tiny little 10 pixels configuration example. So let's have a look at the production version now. And so if we switch back across to Octopus Deploy and we take a quick look at the variables again and we can see that our development has 25 pixels for the font size, production 100 pixels and staging 10 pixels. So if we go back to our overview we can see that we've got development and staging correct then scroll across let's hit the deploy button for production and we have all the same options as before aside from now we have two steps and so let's go ahead and hit the deploy button then we can see now we have a manual intervention step required and we can assign this step to ourselves in order to approve the release and we can say deploy time and then hit the proceed button and then the rest of the steps will automatically begin. It may take a second or two for it to pick itself up. So let's have a quick look at the logs while we're waiting. And here we go. So we're acquiring packages. We can go back to the overview. And we can see here that we're actually told that the production environment is deploying with the spinner. And the production step will take a little while for it to deploy out to our Azure web app. So if we give that a sec. And there we are. So it's completed successfully. And if we click into that step, then we can click on the log for the second part and open the website up. And we can have a look at our production Pete Codes website. Again, we'll take a little second for it to warm up. And there's our production website with its huge configuration example H1 header there and 100 pixels. So if we return to Octopus Deploy now and to the overview page and we scroll across, we can see that all three environments have now deployed. We can do another couple of things as well. If we click into the release, then we can view the details about it as well as redeploying. And we can also view which package was deployed and we can view a snapshot of the variables as well as the full deployment history and then if we go to more and configuration and we click on audit we can also view the entire deployment history for all of the different environments
And we've got one last thing I'd like to run you through here, and that's the facility to be able to send a notification once our deployment process is completed. We can actually complete another step, which sends a message notification to a channel in Teams. So if we go to our projects, and then peak codes, and then to our process here, then we can see our existing manual intervention required and deploy an Azure web app, but we can add another step to the end of this to send a Teams notification. If we click the Add Step button, if we scroll down a little bit, we can see that we have a Community Steps option to choose from here. So if we click that Community Steps option and scroll down, there are a nice set of community contributed step templates here, including everything from .NET Core through ASP.NET, AWS, Bash, Click Once, DLLs, and if we scroll down further, we'll find a Microsoft Teams option. So clicking that, if we scroll back up again, we can see here we have a Microsoft Teams post a message option, which posts a message to Microsoft Teams using a general webhook. So if we click that option, and then we can see here that this is a message just telling us that this is a community contributed step. If we click the Save button, and then if we scroll to the right, we can fill in the details for our Microsoft Teams post a message. If we leave the step name as it is at Microsoft Teams post a message, we can enter some notes and we'll do post a message here and then scroll down. We'll leave it enabled. We can leave the execution location as it is as run on each deployment target as this is the default. And then in targets and roles, we'll select web as we've done before and then scroll down. And now we've been prompted to enter a webhook URL. We can grab this from Microsoft Teams. So if we switch over to Microsoft Teams now, we can create ourselves a new channel for the specific notifications. So we add a channel and we'll call this Octopus Notifications. And we'll leave everything else as the default and click the Add button. Then we can add a new connector here, which will allow us to configure an incoming webhook. If we click the menu item beside Octopus Notifications, and then select the Connectors option, then we can either use the Search option here, or we can just click Add next to Incoming Webhook. Here is a bit of information about the particular connector we're adding. So we can just click the Add button. And now we can configure the webhook. So if we go back to the menu and then click Connectors again, we'll see we have Incoming Webhook and we can click the Configure option. Here we need to set up a name for our webhook. So we'll call this Octopus Hook. We can upload an image if we like, but we can just press the create button and leave it as default. Now if we scroll down, we see our webhook is present just here. So I click the copy button next to that, which has copied it to the clipboard, and we can return to Octopus to paste that in. And if we paste that into our webhook URL location, and we scroll down. We'll see we can set the message title and we can also set the message body. And both of these are pulling in information direct from Octopus. We can see the title has octopus.project.name and also then the body has octopus.web.base URL and also the deployment link. We can set a color here if we like and a timeout and some conditions. So we can set this to run for any environment or only for specific environments. And then we can run this only when it's successful or perhaps on a failure or always run it. And we can start either in parallel or only when the previous step is completed. And we can also require that this step can't be skipped when deploying. For now we'll press the save button and then scroll back up. And then we can go back to our project 
and we can create a release and press the save button and click the deploy to development button and then hit the green deploy button and we'll wait for this to complete and that's the deploy completed and now it should be posting a message out to Teams. And we'll just wait for this step to complete. It'll just take a moment or two. And that's completed. And if we switch back over to Microsoft Teams and click done to this dialog, and close this out, we can see here in the background that peak codes 0.0.5 has deployed to development. So that's worked really well.